Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Insightful Thinkers podcast. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about The Blank Slate by Steven Pinker. Uh, The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature is the full title of it. And this book is really one of the best I've ever read. So it's definitely worth a podcast. It discusses human nature. It discusses... uh, The title is a bit weird because uh, it's titled as if he is almost like uh, he's he's for the blank slate and he is the one denying human nature, but he's actually going against people who think we are blank slates, uh, birth and that we don't have a human nature. Um, this book is not without its criticisms by, um, quite a few detractors that I've, I've, uh, seen. And even when I just typed in uh, blank slate review, I, most of what I saw was negative right off the bat. It has a lot of positive, um, uh, critique as well. And of course it's, it's been nominated for many prizes. Uh, I was nominated for the Pulitzer prize, I think in 2003 for nonfiction. So this book is just because it has its critics doesn't mean it's, uh, it's, it's a joke or that it's, uh, it's not incredibly, uh, detailed and, and it's, it's not a great book. It, It is an incredible book and it remains one of my favorites, despite me only just recently learning about, um, about the critique about it just the other day, but, um, let's, let's, let's analyze it and let's, uh, let's say, talk about what it was about. And it, it brought up some really good discussions about human nature. So I think it's definitely worth, um, worth the discussion, you guys. Um, so what it, what it kind of starts off with is, um, it, it, it talks about some dominant views of human nature that are around today. So one of those being, these being uh, the Judeo-Christian theory, the blank slate, which is empiricism, the noble savage, which is romanticism, uh, the ghost and machine, which is dualism. So these are some of the notable theories that um, have been proposed of human nature. And most of these are kind of tied together in a way. So the Judeo-Christian theory is that the mind exists separately to the body and remains after death. So uh, in this this mind that we have that exists separately to the body, it has a moral sense and it's free, but it does have a tendency towards sin. Now, the blank slate theory... Um, which is, which is also known as empiricism, which was proposed by John Locke. Uh, he says that everything that shapes us comes from experience. <clears throat> There's no human nature. So we are blank slates at birth. Um, this is a useful theory for some ways because it has served to undermine many dogmas. Uh, for instance, it was used to, actually, I don't know if it was used specifically to do this, but it undermines the right of kings. Um, because if there's a blank slate, this means that kings are not superior morally. Everyone's blank, so they should not have higher rights than the rest of the people. Um, it also undermines slavery, which is which is great because if everyone's a blank slate, then no one's inferior to anybody else. Slaves are not inferior uh, to to others in any way. So this is it is useful, although. Pinker later (laughs) goes on to, of course, say why uh, the blank slate is not true, because we have so many lines of evidence showing that it's not true. Um, It is a useful theory. Next, we go to the noble savage theory, uh, also known as romanticism, which was put forth by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He says, uh, we are naturally peaceable. We have no ignoble instincts. Uh, so there's no need for a Leviathan, which which um, was put forth by Hobbes, the Leviathan. The Leviathan is like a domineering, overarching uh, force that keeps, or like a government, for instance, that keeps people in check. So this was put forth by Hobbes, but, and Hobbes was a little bit before Rousseau's time, I believe. And, um, and Rousseau goes against this and he says, no, we're naturally peaceable. We're, we're noble people naturally. We don't need a, a governing body to, to reign over us. Uh, any savage, savagery that we show has arrived um, purely due to corruption by society. Um, so social factors like a Leviathan then actually could have negative effects or, or they do have negative effects on our naturally peaceable selves. That's what... Um, Rousseau says. So again, it's, these are kind of theories that, um, Pinker eventually, uh, I guess you could say denounces through, through a lot of evidence that we, that we have. And, um, uh, yeah, so they're they're all kind of tied into one another. They, 
it's it's different views on human nature. People have had very different views over the years. The next one is the ghost in the machine, also known as dualism. Um, this is by Rene Descartes. So he says that the mind uh, is separate from our biology. So it's separate from our brain and body. We're more than just an organism being controlled by a brain. Instead, we have a capacity for morality and love. And this exists independently of the brain. Um, almost kind of similar to the Judeo-Christian theory because it's like the mind is totally separate from from our brain. The, the mind does not come from the brain. And again, uh, later in the book, Pinker talks about how, no, neuroscience shows that this is not true. Actually, the mind does come from the brain based on all evidence that we have. Um, but these are just some of the theories. And the final one that Pinker introduces is black box behaviorism. Now, the the first, I guess you could say the first and the one of the most important behaviorists, behaviorists excuse me, is John B. Watson. Um, he has the quote, okay, behaviorists, what did they think? So behaviorists thought that, um, or I guess the original behaviorists, which is now known as radical behaviorism, they believed that the mind is essentially like a black box. So we don't know the inner workings of the mind. We don't know the inputs and the outputs. All we can really study is observable behavior. So all, all behavior, uh, maybe it just comes from uh, reinforcements. If, if you are reinforced positively for doing something, you're going to be more likely to do that in the future. And if you're negatively re reinforced or punished for doing something, you're going to be less likely to do that in the future. So all of our behaviors may come from environmental influence. So that, I guess that gives a little bit of context to Watson, the one of the um, eminent behaviorists uh, and one of the first... Uh, he says, give me a, a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief, regardless of his talents, pensions, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. So this is kind of um, very close, you can see, to that blank slate theory of um, as long as you just give me a healthy infant, I, I could turn them into anything. If you give uh, him time to, and if you give me time to train him, I can make him specialize in anything from a doctor to a thief, uh, from a beggar to a lawyer. So this is, this is kind of getting at that, that blank slate idea that people had been kind of putting forth originally and initially in psychology a little bit. Um, and Watson is a prime example of that. Now there, I did actually, uh, happen to read in the, while I was reading some of the reviews for this book that this quote, which is such a famous one in psychology, and it's one of the first things you learn when you're in intro psychology, uh, this quote and how the behaviorists thought, but it's actually a little bit out of context. I learned so one of the, one of the, um, detractors of Pinker's uh, the blank slate book. He actually mentions that Watson after this says something to do with, um, I know this is an over exaggeration, but people on the other side have been over exaggerating as well or something, something to that extent. So this quote actually is a little bit out of context, but either way that in, in psychology, that's kind of what we, um, like to think of the hardcore behaviors. It's you're a blank slate. The mind is a black box. Um, we, you can shape kids into anything. Okay. Um, so Watson is basically saying that psychology should focus on observable events, um, namely stimuli and responses rather than unobservable mental events in the brain that we don't know. We don't know what those mental events are. So why study those things? Um, now the original behaviorists say, we may be more than a blank slate, but we should focus our scientific efforts towards observable behavior more than anything. And because the mind is a black box, um, we don't know what goes in and out of it. Um, uh, so why, why should we worry about, about these inputs and outputs? Just, let's just focus on observable behavior and worry about kind of reinforcement schedules and how environmental influences can shape behavior. Don't worry about how, uh, neural influences can shape behavior, the type of, um, what kind of neural pathways are active when you behave in this way. And he, they just said, forget about it. Let's just worry about observable behavior, which was very influential in psychology and still is today. Um, but, uh, th these theories were a little bit too far according to Pinker and according to many that 
too far in in the sense that um, they're too close to the blank slate. In reality, we have this human nature that uh, we'll get to in a second that Pinker talks about. So Pinker also talks about how once he kind of uh, gets through those theories um, and who's who's what the theories of human nature have been, the blank slate, the Judeo-Christian theory and all these things, he starts to talk about how uh, how the blank slate plays out in today's world. So one way he, he says this plays out, um, he actually was going against very specific writers, but more than anything, he says, um, the blank slate even plays out in, in a little bit of radical feminism we see. And some of the radical feminists who believe that the only difference between men and women is their genitalia. Um, otherwise we're all just the same blank slate anyway. That's what some people, some radical feminists, um, seem, seem to think. And Pinker kind of goes against this. Um, in reality, this, this is far from true. Men and women are very different. And of course, we have incredible uh, similarities. But Penker notes that <laughs> it's not just a simple matter of we're all blank slates and uh, our genitalia are just different. I mean, there's some serious differences here that we've found scientifically. So, for instance, women have a lot more um, cross connections between brain hemispheres. Uh, women are better on average at spelling and interpreting facial expressions, whereas men on average are better at visualizing 3D object rotation uh, and take more risks on average. Um, now, although there exists a great overlap in a lot of these traits, the ends of the distribution on the graph, if you look at it, um, show great difference between men and women. So look at a trait like aggression. This, is, this has been studied pretty widely. So at the middle of the distribution, um, there are similar rates. There are similar rates at kind of mid-level aggression, with with slightly more men at this level. But at 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 minimal aggression, there are far more women, and at maximal aggression, there are far more men. Now let's look at emotional intelligence. At mid-level, there's similar level of emotional intelligence with women having slightly more than men at this level at mid-level emotional intelligence. But at the low end, there are way there are excuse me. So at, at minimal emotional intelligence, there are far more men and at maximal emotional intelligence, there are far more women. So there's a trait where, yes, there's a lot of overlap in the middle, but at maximal emotional intelligence, you see like almost like 90% women, or I don't actually know the numbers. I don't want to uh, put forth anything. I don't, I don't uh, actually know the statistics, but that's what the distribution looks like. There are far more women at that maximal level of emotional intelligence and far, um, far more men at the minimal emotional intelligence level. Now look at a trait like agreeableness, another, uh, another big trait. So there are similar rates of agreeableness at the mid level with slightly more women at this level of a medium agreeableness. But if you go to minimum agreeableness, there are way more men there. And if you go to maximum agreeableness, there are way more, more women at that end of the distribution. So these are traits where yes, we see overlap, but clearly there's some, there's some kind of difference between men and women. And it's, it's, it's more than just, um, <laughs> more than just genitalia or just chromosome, one chromosome difference. It's these things play out in real life. So Pinker kind of says that, um, now there could perhaps be a benefit if we acknowledge these differences rather than just looking at both sexes like a blank slate, because then if we can, if we can acknowledge that there are differences, then we can take the necessary steps towards equalizing the playing field in sectors where women or even where men may be at a disadvantage. Um, you know, if we look at everyone like a blank slate and then we see that, wait a minute, why aren't there as many women in this field or why aren't there as many men in this field? What's wrong? Are we raising them incorrectly? What's going on? Maybe not. Maybe like women and men actually make some different choices here. And um, it's it's something that if we I can understand the difference, then we can, Pinker said, we can go forth to un, to uh, reduce this this disparity between men and women in different fields, and we can actually understand why there's a disparity there. Um, it is to note though that Pinker he is actually he claims that he is a feminist, um, but he does just oppose this branch of feminists that uh, claim that there's virtually no difference between male and males and females. So, uh, and another way that the blank slate plays out in society that Pinker mentions is that. Um, Parents feel as if they have uh, full control over their children, as if it's like a clay mold. Like every single thing they do, it's going to impact the child and that's the way the child's going to develop. But we don't even understand that a lot of parenting styles that are used 
um, are often dependent on the temperament of the child as opposed to the their parenting styles shaping the child. So a, a, a lot of the time, parents actually react to the way the child is just as much as the child reacts to the uh, the parenting style. So um, that, is, that is very interesting what he brought up there. So he kind of says that there is some natural... There's a natural uh, nature, I guess there's a nature that we, we all have and um, the parent is not going to be able to fully shape that nature, you know, um, no matter how hard they try. But we think that we have full control and that's due to this blank slate perception that we have. Um, and what Pinker also says is, well, actually what I was going to say was, um, one of the main critiques of this book was that Pinker is is bringing up some straw man arguments. He's he's making arguments against things that perceptions that don't even really exist in today's society. So he he says there's a widespread belief in the blank slate, or um, there's a widespread belief that parents have full control. But the critics said that this is not actually as widespread as Pinker makes it out to be. So he creates this false uh, arguer, in other words, a straw man, and he argues against that straw man that he makes. That's what some of the critics say, because they say like, who actually thinks, who, what parents actually th think that they have full control over shaping their children um, and that genes play no role. According to Pinker, there are there's enough to write a whole book about how um, we shouldn't subscribe to the blank slate or why it's at least incorrect to subscribe uh, to a blank slate theory. Um, Pinker also goes on to talk about the dangers of a blank slate theory. So the first danger here is that there could be totalitarian social engineering if we believe that everyone is a blank slate. What does this mean? Well, if the human mind is completely formed by the environment alone, then if we can, if we ruthlessly and, and completely control every aspect of the environment, we should be able to create perfect minds. If we believe in this blank slate theory, it could be dangerous in that sense, because then we'll think that everything can be engineered in the environment. It's a possibility. And that's what Pinker says. Um, and we, another danger of the blank slate theory is that we may uh, resort to placing unreasonable blame on parents if their child doesn't necessarily turn out in the best way. So parents may be at fault because, hey, you guys were the ones in full control of molding your child. He didn't turn out right. What, what's wrong? So he kind of, he's showing here that maybe it's better not to believe in a blank slate because then we'll understand, we'll be able to give some leeway to these parents who who uh, their children maybe didn't turn out the best. And you'll hear a lot of parents of, 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 of children who, who did um, terrible things. They'll say, I did not raise them like this or, um, or whatever. Like I, I didn't even know this was happening. And it's like, you know what, honestly, like what parent would think that um, a child was becoming like radical or going down the wrong path? Like, I don't think there are many parents who would want them to be that way. So clearly the parents aren't in full control. But if we believe that the parents are in full control, we'll place unreasonable blame on these parents, Pinker says. Um, Pinker also goes on to talk about why, why is there apprehension for abandoning this blank slate theory? What is the reason we don't want to just get rid of this theory? The first reason is the fear of inequality. If the mind has any innate organization, people would, people say, Different races or sexes are inherently different then, right? Leading to discrimination or oppression. So that's what people people say. If, if, if we abandon the blank slate theory, then, oh no, now races and sexes are inherently different. Now there's going to be discrimination and oppression. But Pinker says, just because we're not the same doesn't mean we can't be treated as equals. Okay, It's okay to understand, hey, we're not the same. We all have different brains, different genes, different things that influence our behavior. Um, that doesn't mean we can't be treated as equals, how, you know? So that's why he says these are all the, all this apprehension for abandoning the blank slate theory, all these things are non sequiturs, he says, because he, he's able to counteract each point pretty effectively. I thought he says there's a fear of imper imperfectibility if we abandon the blank slate theory. So people say if unpleasant traits are innate, then people are rotten to the core, meaning they can't be changed. But Pinker says, then again, we also have counterbalancing facilities too, like propensity for love, morality, and care. So it's not all bad. Just because we're not perfect 
I, it's okay. I mean, just because the genes gave us some traits that made us maybe more aggressive or uh, gave us a propensity to higher anxiety, we also still have some things that counteract that too. So that that shouldn't be a fear, Pinker says. There's a fear of determinism. Uh, if we abandon the blank slate theory among a lot of people, Pinker says, um, people will say, if my kids are predetermined to become a certain way, then I guess it doesn't matter how I treat my kids, right? Pinker says, wait a minute, just because parents don't have full control over how their kids turn out, it doesn't mean they can't have a positive influence. Uh, people also, with a fear of determinism, they might say, well, if genes play a large role in behavior, any criminal could just get off because of his bad genes rather than his actions. Um, but Pinker says, we're still responsible for our actions, even if these actions are determined in part by our brain. Um, so there shouldn't really be a fear, even if um, some things are d determinism means that kind of um, there's no there's no environmental control over what you're be going to become. It's predetermined by your genes in your brain. And Pinker says, uh, you know what, it, it, even if part of the way we are going to become is determined by our genes in our brain, that's OK. We still it doesn't mean it, it's going to be our life is going to be totally predetermined and there, there need there need not be any fear of determinism there. Um, there's also the fear of nihilism that life is going to be meaningless if everything's predetermined. Right. Um, people say if we're just a bundle of programming uh, that's made to pass on our genes, then then how can we have morality in a soul? Life just becomes meaningless. Right. But Pinker says, no, it doesn't need to be because that same bundle of programming also programs us to have the ability to, to choose uh, and make life meaningful, right? So, you know, just because things, just because our genes and our brain have an impact on the way we're going to become, it doesn't mean that everything is meaningless. I mean, we still also have the capacity to make choices in life to, to choose to be happy and to make life meaningful, you know? <laughs> you know, we still have that, that choice. So th those were very interesting arguments against all these, all these irrational fears as Pinker claims of abandoning uh, a blank slate theory. Um, now he, he, he also, after that, he goes into how evidence of why the blank slate right now cannot be true. Um, we have evidence from a lot of different, um, fields that the blank slate is not true. We're born with some kind of innate structure and innate nature. And Pinker kind of does a really good job in saying all the fields and summing them up and saying, I thought he did a great job of, of how, um, of how these different fields kind of coalesce to show we're no, we're no blank slate. Look at cognitive science that has, has done a lot of research on language. Um, now with language, we need an inclination to learn and understand words we hear, or else we'll just be like a blank tape that records information. There needs to be some underlying system to be able to learn, understand, and apply language related information. So obviously if we were a blank slate, how could we learn and, and, and spit back out and understand language and all the intricacies there? We need some kind of programming that allows us to even be receptive to that in the first place uh, before we can before we can learn that language or else we're just like a tape recorder that I'm recording on right now and I'm checking the time on the recording. Um, <laughs> we're not going to be able to understand anything. We're just going to be able to record it. And and uh, that's that doesn't go so well for a blank slate theory. The fact that we have language is what Pinker says. You look at the field of genetics even the merely the discovery of well, not merely, but the discovery of the gene by Gregor Mendel. Uh, the gene is a heritable sequence of DNA that codes for proteins. Proteins are the building blocks for life itself. Genes are passed on. That's what it means to be heritable. They're passed on from generations. You can inherit a gene from, from your parent and your, and hence your parents, parents, which are your grandparents and, and, and so forth. That's how the genes get passed down. Literally, it was first discovered in peas, how different genes and different alleles, which are different forms of different genes get passed down, um, across the generations. If things are getting passed down to me from my two parents and then from my grandparents, then how am I a blank slate if stuff already was passed down to me? So it was a very simple argument to show, hey, we're not a blank slate. Um, 
the discoveries, kind of as I was mentioning, that many traits are her- heritable, at least in part. These traits go from violence and aggression to intelligence and agreeableness. So we've we've discovered uh, through genetic research that a lot of traits are heritable, which means that um, this trait, well, the trait is heritable, so like a trait like intelligence, for instance, is heritable. So it's correlated to the intelligence of your parents. It's not fully due to the intelligence of your parents, but there's a correlation there. Just like there's a correlation between the aggression, uh, the the genes of aggression that maybe your father or mother has, and that gets passed down to you. So there's a correlation there. Now, it doesn't mean that just because you have an aggressive father, you're going to be aggressive, but there's a small correlation often that plays out there. So a lot of these traits, clearly something's getting passed down. Um, and this, this really goes against the noble savage as well, the noble savage theory, because even rash traits like aggression uh, are heritable to some extent. So clearly we're not pure at birth and then we get corrupted by society. There's already impurity getting passed down, Im- impurity I say, but there's it's not really pure or impure, but there's already rash traits like aggression getting passed down. So clearly we're not some noble noble uh being that only is corrupt is corrupted only by the environment around him or her right um even the big five personality traits have all been found to be heritable to some extent which is openness to experience conscientiousness extroversion introversion agreeableness and neuroticism um these are all heritable to some extent so we're not (laughs) we're no blank slate the the way our parents were they they um the traits that they had get passed down to us at least to some level okay it doesn't mean you're going to be just like your parents but in some ways it's inevitable you're going to be like them uh in ways that you may not understand and uh different ways you look you may oh i don't look like either of my parents whatever but it's a mix of genes that were passed down to create you so you know no one is a blank slate is what pinker is saying um now i don't know about uh, all the research on this, but he he did um, because some of the critics were saying that he was he didn't like some of the areas were not so well researched. Um, and guys, when I bring up these critics, like I mean, you gotta read the book because the book is is incredible. So there's always gonna be critics, even for the most masterful works. I'm, I'm sure Shakespeare even had his fair share of critics back in the day, but. For any masterful work, there's going to be critique, but I, I, I don't want you guys to be discouraged from reading this book just because I keep mentioning the critics. I just wanted to read some of what the negatives were saying before I'd want it, before I made some kind of a, a discussion about um, about how much I love the book or whatever, because I want to understand, like, is what is what Pinker's saying actually fully true? Did he do his research? And this is what I was saying, where some of the areas that critics said he didn't research so well. Um, you know, and, and something is like this. So he says, even incredibly specific things such as dependence on alcohol, likelihood of divorce and likelihood of divorcing have been found to be heritable to a certain extent. I don't know if there's been, uh, too much research after this book. This book was published, I believe in O two or O three. It's been, I mean, what, 17 years now. It's going to be like a couple decades old soon, but I don't know about the research after this, but it seems like even very specific traits get passed down is what Pinker is saying. So there's no trait that you can find that said, Hey, this was just blank. This was, this came from a blank mind. And, and now I have this trait, like almost everything, like somehow it's heritable is what Pinker is saying. He's really, um, uh, putting forth this idea that genes are kind of very powerful in determining the way we are. And he goes on to uh, talk about this with the ident- with identical twin studies. Why are identical twin studies important? Identical twin studies are important because identical twins are 100% genetically identical. So that means that genes are controlled for, and the only difference is differences in the environment. Starting in the prenatal environment, maybe one baby in the womb was in a different position and their brain developed a different way, or uh, they were getting... Uh, more nutrients in a certain way or whatever, but either way, their genes are a hundred percent genetically identical because it's the same fertilized egg. So same chromosome, same exact same DNA that just got split into two. So these studies are important because genes are controlled for the environment is the only difference guys. So, um, if, if the, I guess you could say if genes are important, then, then we, we should predict to see that, um, 
that twins remain similar regardless of the environment that they that they go through. And look what we find, guys. There's a twin study where one twin was brought up in Catholic Nazi Germany, uh, and and one twin was as a Jew in Trinidad. Now, when they met back up way later in life, I don't know when, both dipped butter toast in coffee. Both liked sneezing in crowded elevators to scare people. Both flushed the toilet before and after using it. So these are just such uncanny similarities that clearly they did not get these things from their shared environment. They live in totally different environments. Something in their genes just propelled them to be this way because they are literally clones living in different environments. So clearly the genes have some type of power, although this is very anecdotal. There are other studies just like this that show very similar. I think this is the one Pinker employed in the book. Um, he might have employed a different, a different one, or he might have said a few more, but this is one that I remember. And, um, that just is what Pinker uses to kind of show the power of the genes. We're born with something, guys. We're, we're not just some blank slate. Uh, so twin studies like this show there must be at least some heritability for traits. We have a genetic code that undermines the blank slate theory, you guys. Um, now, another, another evidence... Other evidence coming from genetics research is that uh, siblings separated at birth show just as many differences as siblings raised together. So look, maybe the environment didn't play too much of a role because if the siblings raised in the same household are no different than siblings separated at birth, what <laughs> what uh, impact did the parents and the, the culture shaping on them really have? Um, again, the some of the my personal critique about that though is that i think pinker understates some of the Im serious impacts of the environment on shaping behavior because those have been shown to be huge i mean just a few episodes ago you guys we talked about how social media can impact the brain and behavior and how we feel that it could be uh changing our behavior so I am more of a proponent that the environment has a huge role. Obviously, I'm no blank slate guy, but but uh, but no, the environment I think is a bigger role than Pinker wanted to admit in this, and we'll get into that just in a few minutes with the with what else the critics said. But um, uh, another evidence from genetics going against the blank slate is that adopted siblings raised together who share no genes, but fully share an environment because they're adopted siblings raised together. They show no notable similarities, any different than just a regular pair of siblings that actually, you know, so these adopted siblings that are raised together, the parental influence didn't make them more similar than if the adopted siblings were raised apart. So the genes kind of took over and just allowed the adopted sibling to just be what it was going to become, kind of this deterministic thing that Pinker kind of was walking up the line of parental influence as no, has hardly any impact. But um, either way, guys, he's showing studies that show the genes have a huge role. And this is why the blank slate is not real. The blank slate theory is not real. Finally, we get into neuroscience research and neuroscience primarily goes against the ghost in the machine. Um, so Pinker, I'll actually quote from Pinker. He says, we know that by sending an electrical current to the brain, you can have a lifelike experience and that the chemical environment of the brain can radically affect emotion and perception and experience. Um, so clearly in changing the brain is changing our mind. So how in the world could it be a mind free of the brain when the brain is damaged or we have a concussion or uh, you have CTE, you see the behaviors that I was actually just like watching some of the football players um, who have done some, some pretty questionable things or whatever. And then after their death, I guess I should say more than questionable because it's not something to be taken lately because a lot of these people... Uh, with CTE have committed suicide and have killed people and done some very egregious things. And they've been shown to have CTE. Basically, I'm saying all this to say that when your brain is altered, um, you are going to behave in a different way. So how in the world could the mind be independent of a damaged brain? You're, the ghost in the machine would predict that even with a damaged brain, um, 
you should be able to behave just fine, right? Because your mind is separate from your brain. But no, that's not true at all. And research, neuroscience research, research has showed that. Take any drugs that you take or alcohol. I mean, when you take that, we see that that's impacting the brain. And then that's impacting the way you think and your behavior. Um, it's changing it for better or for worse, depending what drugs you're taking, guys. It's, it's happening in the brain and that's changing your consciousness. So there's a link there. Well, more than a link, it's... A, it's, it's a purely, um, it's like, a, it's a complete causality. It's not even correlated. It's the mind comes from the brain. I realize there are some opponents of this theory still. So maybe it isn't such a straw man that Pinker is bringing up because, um, in some of the discussion I was having about my consciousness post where I was kind of having, I was putting forth kind of like a causal link between brain activity and consciousness. People were saying, you can't convince me that, uh, the mind comes from the brain, at least not yet. And I was saying, why not? I mean, what evidence do you have to show the mind doesn't come from the brain? Um, but so clearly there are still some people out here that, that say that, uh, that kind of believe in a sense of the ghost in the machine. So maybe Pinker it was right in writing this book to kind of show them that, Hey, that's not true. You guys, um, we'll close out here. You guys with going into some of the stuff that, uh, other stuff that the critics have said that I've actually kind of mentioned throughout this, this episode, but guys, <laughs> I know you, t I know I tell you guys to read a lot of, or do a lot of things or whatever, do this, do that, read this, listen to Timothy Butterfly, watch X Machina, uh, read this book, but just do it. I mean, you don't need to do these things to listen to the podcast, but just out of my recommendation, something that I love, you might love it too. Because if you're interested in what you're watching right now about human nature and the blank slate, then you'll definitely be interested in this book where this entire podcast is coming from or this episode. So read that, uh, or listen to it on audible is, is the way I was able to do it. But, um, but yeah, so, so what do some of the critics say? And I, I say all that be, because I want to put that before I talk about what the critics say. I don't want you guys to just be influenced by uh, the critique. But some of the critics say that Pinker downplays, kind of as I was mentioning, the effect of the environment on development. And I think he does that a little bit too. So they say he puts forth the straw man argument, which I was talking about. So he argues against some so-called widespread belief that the environment totally shapes a person. But does this opinion even really exists today that the environment totally shapes a person? Is Pinker just inventing this opposition just to create a straw man so he can argue against that and rail on about it in a book? People also say that on top, on top of the straw man Pinker puts forth, he argues his points with tedious examples that lack scientific rigor. Now, I don't know about all that because he, oh my gosh, this book was incredibly well researched for the most part. Now, some of the detractors did say there were some areas like he, he talked about, um, like one of the areas was the quote of Watson. He didn't even put it in context and, uh, some of the things he was talking about, uh, BF Skinner and behaviorism. And he, he incorrectly said that one of Skinner's books was about, it was all about pigeons and rats, but it had no mention of pigeons. Um, although Skinner did do a lot of research with pigeons in that specific book, it had no mention of pigeons. So some of the things were a little bit, I mean, when you read or listen, read the book, you're going to realize like, how can one man even know so much like the way how well researched it was it's unbelievable like how he was able to synchronize all these different areas from different fields and even though he would he met had some missteps on a couple areas it shouldn't um steer you away from reading it but that's what they said and and i'll quote one thing from schlinger I don't remember his first name, but he says the scholarship in the blank slate is less than exemplary and probably represents a case where personal ambition has clouded objectivity. In the examples I've described, Pinker engaged in less than adequate scholarship, misrepresentation or misunderstanding of and unnecessary personal attacks on those with whom he disagrees. Such strategies might sell books, but in the long run, they do not serve objective science. Um, so Schlinger, he is a, I believe a professor at Caltech. I don't know what he, uh, what he researched or whatever, but clearly he feels, Hey, this book is not, is it's just like soft science, whatever. And, but honestly, you guys like a book like that, it's, it's hard to find hard science books that just read like a novel. 
you know, like otherwise you got to go to a textbook and he, Pinker was not writing a textbook here. You know, he was making a point about the blank slate and how we've uh, found out that the blank slate isn't true through a lot of lines of research. And I mean, that's a little bit harsh. I think it's, it's not going to be hard science. This is not a textbook schlinger. Okay. <laughs> that's what I would say. But, um, Reasonable criticism, I have to say. Now, my personal critique, I already mentioned that, you guys. I was going to close the episode with that, but I've already mentioned that um, just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how the environment does play a role in modulating your mind and the way you think. It's social media, if you want to go uh, uh, check that episode out, because I talk about that there. So I, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a proponent for the idea that the environment has a huge role in shaping us, guys. If you grow up in a bad environment... Yeah, you can make it out of that, but it's going to be tough, guys. And that's why I'm going to do a future episode possibly about um, how to mitigate the effects of a poor environment in education, for instance. How could we possibly make it so that even if you have a bad surrounding environment, man, even if you live in the ghetto, whatever, you can still find a way to get a good education to allow you to break out of that, to break out of your environment that's, that's only bringing you down. It's a tough, it's a tough problem, but I'll see if I can find some, um, some people who have done a lot more work on it than me, who who researchers or people who have written books about it. I'll see what I can find. I'll see if I can sync together an episode about that. But, um, that's basically everything you guys, Steven Pinker, the blank slate, the modern denial of human nature. One of the best books I've ever read in my entire life, guys. One of my favorites ever. Uh, and hopefully it's one, it's one of yours if, if you guys read it as well. Um, guys, we've got a lot of episodes coming. I've been, uh, yeah, we've been, we've been working here and we are going to keep it rolling out. There's like a million, there's right now, there's a bit of an imbalance between ideas for episodes and output. So we're going to level up that output so we can match the, uh, rate of ideas coming in about different episodes and, and what I'm content I'm taking in. We're going to try to find a better balance guys. Keep walk with me on the journey. Um, speaking of walking with me on the journey, if you want to do that, what are the ways you guys can support? Number one, you've already supported You've already watched or you've listened to the podcast. Thank you for that. You can just leave with that. And, uh, I love you guys. Thank you for that. But, uh, if, if, if you want to add something else, I always say share it with a couple people who you think would like this discussion on human nature and the blank slate. You can share your own ideas um, or questions you have for me. Use the connect page on the website. You can just do it. It's like it goes by through email and I get it and I'll reply and um, we can discuss whatever, whatever questions or comments you have. You can also just comment in the YouTube comment section if you're watching this video now. If you're on Apple Podcasts, you can rate it, you can review it, you can do whatever you'd like. If you're on YouTube, Go ahead and subscribe if you like, uh, <clears throat> I think this is the sixth episode. Um, it's the sixth of, of many, but um, if you like kind of what you're seeing with the in-depth analysis idea, that's what we're going to keep going with. So if you like in-depth analysis, then subscribe to that um, or subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. Uh, go ahead, read some of the blog posts. There's a couple poems on there, guys. Uh, you can read those. And... Um, there's a couple other po- uh, a couple other posts too. There was the parasite uh, analysis, all kind of in written form there. So, guys, check out the blog post. Check out the website. Check it all out. You can also go on Patreon. I told you guys we have a Patreon page, and uh, I was thinking on Patreon of doing video calls for patrons, uh, where it's like me, kind of like a Zoom meeting that you guys are probably getting more familiar with now with the virus and whatnot of. Uh, us just discussing things, analyzing things. It can be whatever, but if you want to do that, maybe I, I have that right now through Patreon. So if you want to go there, we can do a video call. We can do one-on-one. We can do group discussions as we get more people. So these are just some of the things you can do to support guys. I'm loving this so far. I say it every time, but I really am. We're going to turn up the output and, uh, we're not going to stop guys. Um, <laughs> I'm always looking for some words to close it out, but I think I've summed it all up, you guys. In depth, and I never know the title when I'm recording them, so that's why sometimes the title doesn't match. But in depth analysis, uh, the blank slate, the modern denial of human nature by Steven Pinker. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching. We'll be back with the next episode later. See you guys later.